It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Premier has been caught repeatedly using his personal phone to conduct government business contrary to guidelines. This appears to be a way to avoid freedom of information disclosures. And it seems that this culture of non-compliance has evidently spread to other ministers. Global News found the ministers for education, finance, health, housing, and transportation either never or rarely made calls on their government-issued phones during crucial moments when key and very controversial government decisions were being made. So, Speaker, to the Premier, is it standard practice for ministers to avoid accountability in this way? And to reply, the government has stated. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Look, uh, or Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Yes. Uh, uh, look, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, ministers uh, and, uh, and the Premier, of course, uh, follow all the rules as, uh, as set out by, uh, uh, by Integrity Commissioner and the Information uh, Commissioner, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, look, uh, the ministers and the caucus members uh, on, the, on this government have been very, very accountable to the people of the province of Ontario, and that is why we won a massive majority from the people in the last election, Mr. Speaker. That is why the ranks of the Progressive Conservative Caucus have grown, and primarily it's because we have been focused on what matters to the people of the province of Ontario, building more homes, improving the economy, groundbreaking legislation that has seen us bring over $27 billion worth of investments to the province of Ontario at a time when the rest of the world was being caught. Ontario was thriving, Mr. Speaker. That is a level of accountability I will take each and every day, and it is why the people of the province of Ontario have supported us in larger numbers, election after election. Here, here. Supplementary question. Speaker, uh, the Minister of Health didn't make a single call on her government issued phone in January this year. That's odd because that month the Minister was preparing to open up the public health care system to private for profit surgical clinics. You'd think she'd been on the phone constantly. Indeed, you see, because of those sweeping changes, a for profit clinic owned by ClearPoint, now gets paid more than twice what a public hospital gets paid for common surgical procedures. Wow. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. Did the Minister of Health discuss these changes in advance with Christine Elliott, her predecessor as Health Minister and now a lobbyist for ClearPoint? Yeah. <laughs> Speaker, like, what an odd line of questioning from the Leader of the Opposition, right? She's searching out when people are using their phones. I'll tell you what the Minister of Health is doing, like every other minister of the government. We're not contemplating, like, how many times did I turn my phone on each and every day? There are other ways of communicating, you know, my iPad, actually. I can text message on my iPad. Order. But here's an innovation. Here's a massive innovation that has never obviously occurred to the NDP. Order. It's called looking at somebody across the table and saying, what is the advice that you have for me? It's about bringing people in and talking to them, right? Now, I know they don't like to do that over there, right? They don't Order. like to do that over there because when they talk to each other, they divide, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> So the less they talk, the Response. better it is for the NDP. But in this caucus, progressive conservatives, we enjoy each other. We enjoy the public, and that is why the public has put their confidence in us. That's why businesses are coming back and investment is increased. The final supplementary. Speaker, thank you, Speaker. Uh, the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing made only Order. 20 minutes of calls using his government-issued phone last November. Now, think back, Speaker. This was the month the minister announced changes to the Greenbelt, as well as the forced expansions of the urban boundaries of Hamilton, York, Peel, Ottawa, and other municipalities. There is evidence the government gave preferential treatment to the favoured speculators who benefited from these changes. So to the Premier, did the minister stay off his government-issued phone to avoid leaving a record of who he was talking to? Members will take their seats. Government House Leader. 
<laughs> All right. That's a standing ovation from the MVP, right? <laughs> Honestly speaking, I hope my daughters aren't watching this today because I fight with them to stay off the phone all the time. I tell them, you know what you can do? Talk to people. Talk to people. Use Zoom. Zoom. If you want to see somebody face to face, invite them in. Have roundtables. I know the Minister Order. of Finance and the Department Order. of Assistance are crisscrossing the province doing, you know what? Not talking to people on a phone. They're meeting face to face, getting ideas on what we should have in the next budget. That is what this caucus is doing. We do it all the time. My gosh, I know the Minister of Agriculture and a number of caucus members were at the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. You know what they were doing? Talking, Talking to people about the great things that are coming. We're in a chamber Response. that does what? Talks to each other, Mr. Speaker. So I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition, I know that their party is based on the principles of 1933, but the modern age has many other ways of communicating, not just the old technology that is a phone. Order. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, this government, Speaker, it's pretty clear this government will try absolutely anything to avoid accountability, but they can't hide forever. Speaker, the RCMP the RCMP has started their investigation into this government's shady greenbelt grab. The unit that's handling this case, it's called the Sensitive and International Investigations Unit, is responsible for high-risk matters that cause significant threats to Canada's political, economic and social integrity. My question is for the Premier. Has the Premier or anyone in his staff been in contact with the RCMP regarding the investigation into the Greenbelt Grab? <laughs> Mr. Minister of Affairs and Housing. As I've uh, said uh, right from day one, we will work with uh, with uh, the RCMP or any the Information and Privacy Commissioner, the Integrity Commissioner, we will assist them in their investigation. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has also been very clear that we would do that and we will continue to do that. But make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, we will not be sidetracked from what our mission is, and the mission is to build 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Right? Our mission is to get people out of their parents' basement and into their first home, Mr. Speaker. Our Order. mission is to ensure that people who graduate from college, university, who are going into the trades, having their first job, can enjoy the same dreams that almost every single one of us in this chamber have, the value and the dream of a home, Mr. Speaker, of their own. That is what we are focused on. We will not be sidetracked on that mission, despite the fact that the NDP and the Liberals worked so hard for 15 years Spons. to put obstacles in the way that the largest landmass in the country has a housing crisis, Mr. Speaker. We'll disentangle that. We'll get the homes built. We'll get people out of their parents' basement and into the homes that they deserve, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. So, Speaker, I guess they won't answer that question. Let's try another one. Speaker, earlier this month, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing confirmed that the RCMP has been in touch with his ministry. They are already sniffing around the Cabinet and other members of government caucus who have deep connections to these land speculators. This scandal has already cost the government two Cabinet ministers and multiple staff members, not to mention a full year wasted on speculator-friendly policies that had to be reversed because they did not meet the needs of Ontarians. So my question is for the Premier. How many current or former cabinet ministers or political staff have been contacted by the RCMP? Members will take their seats. Minister of Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we'll let, uh, we'll let them do their job and we'll work with them as they, uh, as they required and we'll assist them in doing so, Mr. Speaker. But the Leader of the Opposition is correct about one thing. We are reversing a lot of the damage that was done by the Liberal and NDP coalition, right? We're having to do that. Now, listen, the NDP have a, have a candidate in their current by-election. You know what she's known as? She's known as the Queen of NIMBY. You know why? Because she's turned down 1,174-unit development in downtown, another 10-story, 132 units in downtown. 532 residential units, which also was in downtown, which contained thousands of extra dollars for affordable housing. You know why she turned that down, the NDP candidate? Because it was too close to a pickleball court, Mr. Oh. Speaker. Now, Spots? I think I'm too young to play pickleball, Mr. Speaker, but I tell you what. 
I tell you what, this is the culture of the NDP. Turn down everything and then find an excuse. Blame it on the pickleballers. That's Thank you. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the government members know they're in big trouble, and that's why they're trying so hard to change the channel, but they are out of time and their house of cards is falling. <laughs> the attorney General and the Integrity Commissioner reports expose rampant preferential treatment for Order. donors and insiders of this government. The RCMP has even appointed a special prosecutor because of the scale of this government's dirty dealings. Speaker, to the Premier, what is it going to take for you and your government to come clean with the people of Ontario? My God. I'm going to caution the Leader of the Opposition on the use of uh, the expressions that she's using. I'm going to call upon the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke to please come to order, and I'll recognize the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, my goodness, that was one heck of a, of a question. Listen, I tell you what, we went to the people of the province of Ontario and we said we want to build more homes, and the people of the province of Ontario put their faith and confidence in us, and they increased the members of this party by what I think 10 historic levels of support for the party because they wanted us to continue what we're doing building more homes building an economy that works for more people in the province of Ontario the only party that is having trouble in this place outside of the the van party is the opposition leaders party right they can't even caucus together because every time they caucus together they fight I mean this is a leader of the opposition who ran unopposed for the leadership of the party you know why because nobody wanted to lead the party, Mr. Speaker, and Order. that is why the people of the province of Ontario put their faith in progressive conservatives, Response. because right from day one, it has been progressive conservatives who have built roads. It has been us who have built schools, colleges, universities. It is us who have built an economy that works for all people. We call the member for Hamilton Mountain to order. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, CBC reported that privately owned Don Mill Surgical Suite was pace rate noticeably higher than what the province provides public hospital for the exact same procedure. This government paid $1,200 for cataract surgery at the for profit clinic versus giving $500 for the same surgery in a public hospital. Even worse, the Ford government paid $4,000 for a meniscectomy in a for-profit clinic versus $1,200 in our public hospital. Can the Premier explain why he is willing to pay private clinic 240% to 333% more to private clinic than he pays to our public hospital for the exact same procedure. Parliamentary Assistant to Minister of Health, Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As announced last January, our government's expansion to further leverage community surgical and diagnostic centres was and has always been about finding capacity where there is capacity within our publicly funded health care system. Our government is taking action to deliver more publicly funded procedures to reduce wait times for people and to reduce the surgical backlog. And since 2020, our government has also invested nearly a billion dollars through the Surgical Recovery Fund to open hospital operating rooms on weeknights and weekends, but we knew more could be done, and that is why we initiated four new cataract surgery clinics, and I'm very pleased to say they added 14,000 extra cataract surgeries this year, which means 14,000 grandmothers and grandfathers are able to get back to work read to their grandchildren, and do other things that make life worthwhile. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, in light public hospitals, which provide care based on our needs, the number one goal of a private clinic is to make money. These clinics only accept clients that are easy. They send the riskier, the more complex, the more expensive patient back to the public hospital Yet, 
or public hospital have better outcomes. This government is making sure that Centric Health Corporation makes a lot of money off the back of sick people at the expense of taxpayers. Centric Health Corporation is a division of Kingston Capital Partner, whose state of goal is, and I quote, to create, to create top performing investment solutions for our investors. Mm. Does that speak of quality care? Hmm. Can the Premier explain why he is paying two to three times the price to a private for-profit clinic whose goal is to provide top performing investment solutions to their investors? And to reply once again, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite has been here for many years. She's been a member in this legislature, and she knows that uh, this government is actually funding hospitals and surgical clinics the way they they have been funded for years. Order. Frankly, uh, we're making sure that we have Order. more surgeries done for patients, but the member opposite is making an apples and oranges comparison. Hospitals receive funding through a budget for the entirety of their operations. Community surgical diagnostic clinics receive one-time funding for procedures only and have to take capital and operating costs out of that funding. These centres have higher costs because they're purchasing equipment or renting equipment in some cases cases because of their one-time funding. So all of this goes to make it a different apple and oranges comparison, Absolutely. but what we can tell you is more people Order. are getting Response. access to care faster, paid for, with their OHIP card, and that's what people care about. Order. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Over the past few weeks, I have heard from many of my constituents who are deeply unhappy and very concerned about the impact of the carbon tax on their day-to-day -day lives. When the federal government forced the carbon tax on Ontario, hard-working families were slapped with a 14.3 cent per litre increase in the price of gas, costing them hundreds of dollars a year. As if that wasn't already expensive enough. The federal carbon tax is costing family more in grocery bills every month. The costs are passed on to the consumer when transportation, refrigeration, and electricity prices increase because of the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the federal carbon tax negatively impacts the people of Question. Ontario and what our government is doing to provide support? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Energy. Thanks to the member opposite for the question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, since we took government, we've been doing everything that we can to try and make life more affordable for the people of Ontario as the federal government continues to jack up the carbon tax year over year over year. You know, we brought in a number of initiatives, including removing 10 cents a litre off the price of gasoline, Mr. Speaker, bringing in the Ontario electricity rebate, lowering electricity bills by 15 per cent, taking the tolls off highways, sending people back a rebate on their license plate sticker fees and eliminating those fees, Mr. Speaker, and so much more, the care and the lift and the staycation tax credits, just to name a few, Mr. Speaker. We've been trying our best to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. The federal Liberals continue to drive up the carbon tax. These Ontario Liberals haven't learned a darn thing, Mr. Speaker. Liberals driving people into energy poverty at the federal Order. level and the Response. provincial level, and not only do these Liberals not only are they happy with the current carbon tax, they want to see it triple by 2030. Order. A supplementary question. You won't have to write a letter. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. I was very pleased to see the strong leadership shown by our Premier at the recent Council of Federation meeting regarding the impact of the carbon tax. It was remarkable to see that Premiers from NDP, Liberal, and Conservative governments across Canada share the same view regarding the harmful impact that the carbon tax is having on our provinces and territories. Speaker, the collective support by Premiers in calling on the federal government to remove the carbon tax on heating pumps and fairness for all Canadians confirms that this issue is creating significant burdens everywhere across this great country. That is why it is so astonishing that the Liberal and NDP members in this legislature continue to work against any efforts to make life 
more affordable for Ontarians? Speaker, Question. can the minister please explain more about the negative impact that the carbon tax has on so many Ontarians? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Uh, thanks again, Speaker, and uh, thanks to the member opposite. Uh, for the question this morning. You know, it's about time that the federal Liberal government and our Ontario Liberal counterparts realize the impact that uh, an increasing carbon tax is not just having on the price of the pumps, Mr. Speaker, but the impact it's having on inflation in our province, and it's impacting particularly people in rural Ontario and in the northern part of Ontario, but it's impacting everybody, Mr. Speaker. We're surrounded by police officers here this morning, Mr. Speaker. I can only imagine the impact that the carbon tax is having on our police services and our municipalities when they go to fill up their police cruisers to make sure our communities are safe. You know, we've heard from the agriculture minister on the impact it's having on the price of food because of increased cost on farmers, but these liberals in Ontario are they, they are rock solid, Mr. Speaker, in Response? their support of a federal carbon tax that's making it more expensive for the people of Ontario every single day. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last month, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing was asked about ministerial zoning orders. He said, and I quote, What I'm concerned with are those MZOs that have led to no action being taken. The MZOs that I am pleased with, of course, are the ones that the Minister of Long-Term Care has asked for, unquote. Well, it turns out the Toronto Star looked at several MZOs issued for long-term care homes and found that in most cases there was no action being taken with them either. This includes MZOs issued for long-term care homes on government-owned land. My question is this, why is this minister so pleased that his MZOs are not getting long-term care homes built? Minister of Affairs and Housing. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here today, Mr. Speaker, because the, the member in her question highlights the exact reason why I'm bringing bills to the House to actually untangle the mess that was left behind by the NDP and the Liberals, right? So now, look, just the other day, just the other day, we opened up the largest long-term care home, I think, in Ontario. And that was well replaced. I, got to, I have to thank Tess Romain. She's doing a great job there, the largest long-term care home uh, uh, in, in the province there, 600, over 600 beds. Now, that was getting done because under the Liberals and the NDP, you will remember, colleagues, there were fewer homes built across the entire province in the 15 years that they governed uh, together than that home, than that one home has in that one community, Mr. Speaker. But I have said I will remove the obstacles that municipalities are putting in the way of building long-term care. I thank you for your support of that. I will bring a bill forward to this House to make sure that long-term care homes get built across the province. Thank you. And the supplementary question, Mr. Levin, North Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is back to the Premier. Last week, the Toronto Region Board of Trades report warned that this government's changes to planning rules are putting 1.5 million jobs at risk. The Trillium reported that major Conservative Party donors successfully lobbied the former minister to punch a hole in Peel Region's employment zone plans, undermining the integrity of this crucial employment area against the recommendations of civil servants. When will the Premier stop putting jobs at risk and stop giving preferential treatment to his speculator friends? Members, please take your seats. The Premier. Mr. Speaker, is it the same Toronto Board of Trade that I went to that had overwhelming support on our policies of creating economic development, creating 700,000 jobs, making sure we're building new homes, we're getting shovels in the ground, we're going to hit our 1.5 million target. Now, Mr. Speaker, compared to the NDP and Liberals that lost 300,000 jobs, that didn't open up long-term care, didn't build hospitals, closed 600 schools. We're doing the opposite. We're building schools, building highways, building bridges, making sure that we get the infrastructure, the $184 billion we're spending in infrastructure, Twitter. to make sure we continue going, make sure we're a leader in North America in economic development, job creation, and housing. But thank you for the question. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. 
The carbon tax negatively impacts businesses in communities across my riding of Carleton in Ontario and especially in the north. For example, the punitive nature of the carbon tax leads to higher prices for raw materials. This will, in turn, mean increased prices for consumers on basic building materials like concrete and wood. Because of the carbon tax, good companies like Carmus, who operate a lime kiln near Blind River, are being negatively impacted. The majority of the carbon dioxide they produce is part of the process of turning limestone into lime. They have no other way to reduce those emissions. Speaker, through you. Can the minister please share what impact the carbon tax is having on the natural resources sector and what actions our government is taking to support its continued growth? Thank you. To apply for the government, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, yet uh, another example of how the carbon tax is hurting Ontarians. And you know, there, there's a better way. Of course, there are industries that can't help but produce CO2 in what they do to make our lives better every day. And you can have a carbon tax that's punitive against everyday individuals, or maybe you can go about it in a different way, like this government's gone about it, like this premier, this minister of economic development, job creation and trade by supporting electric art furnaces in Hamilton and Sault Ste. Marie, taking the equivalent of two million cars off the road. That's an incredible number, Mr. Speaker. Maybe you can go about it a different way in opening up the opportunities for carbon capture and storage in Ontario, like we're doing through my ministry, to make sure that that CO2 never hits the air and is safely stored for eternity or provides Spons? options around green hydrogen. There are other ways, Speaker. It's called supporting business, not being punitive to the families in Ontario with a carbon tax that achieves absolutely nothing. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, thank you to the minister for the response. It's truly shocking to see that the independent Liberals and opposition NDP continue to support this punitive carbon tax that is making manufacturing materials so much more expensive. The carbon tax is raising the price of everything and impacting all industries throughout our province. This means fuel prices will increase, creating a chain reaction of rising costs throughout the economy. Any barrier that creates delays and financial hardships in this sector negatively impacts Ontario's growth and economic prosperity. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain the impact of the carbon tax on the natural resources sector and what actions our government is taking in response? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Yeah, I have one word for the impact of the carbon tax on the natural resources sector. Terrible just as it's terrible for Ontarians. But here we are, Mr. Speaker, again, a government that's taking steps to make Ontario greener and cleaner. The Minister of Energy is expanding our nuclear fleet. The Minister of Mines is working on building that road to the Ring of Fire, which will extract those precious metals to support the EV battery capital of the world here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the great work of our Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, and the support that this government has shown for what the future of automobiles will be. Mr. Speaker, there's so much opportunity to support businesses in Ontario. Through my ministry, our forest biomass program, a $20 million program, is looking towards innovation, looking towards a green economy for use of wood products in medicine, bioplastics, 3D printing, biodiesel even jet fuel, uh, jet fuel, more emissions, fewer emissions, more jobs. Fewer emissions, more jobs, Mr. Speaker. It's that easy, and that's what innovation that's... looks like. So this carbon tax, it's punitive. All it does is beat up the wallet. Well, we're not going to support it. We're going to support businesses here in Ontario. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Toronto Star has begun releasing a series on the conditions impacting children in Ontario. They revealed there are nearly 30,000 children, those are kids under 18, on the wait list for mental health care in Ontario. Provincial funding levels are grossly inadequate and don't meet the needs of an increasing number of struggling children. Some kids wait up to two years for access to treatment. Some don't get it at all. Some experiencing mental health crisis go to an emergency department and get discharged a few days later without a treatment plan. Some return to hospital. Some self-harm, and some die by suicide. Premier, why is your government making children languish on wait lists for mental health support, and what do you have to say to the families who have lost a child to suicide while waiting for help? Exactly. 
the Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Speaker, and thank you for that question. You know, we all know in this House that children and youth need accessible and reliable services if they're to grow into healthy adults. And that's why since 2019, $130 million has gone into children and youth mental health services via the Roadmap to Wellness. This includes, and in addition to, through the Roadmap, another $170 million over the next three years. In education, $90 million for school-based supports and $20 million for an across-the-board 5% funding increase. In addition, we're extremely proud of our youth wellness hubs and the investments that we've made that are providing mental health and addiction, primary care, early interventions, and walk -in, all on a walk-in basis, and the warm handoffs that result to community providers from Once. them. Mr. Speaker, children and youth are our future, and our government is making and will continue to invest in them. Les enfants et les jeunes sont notre avenir. Uh, children and youth are our future, and our government will continue to invest uh, for them and in them. Question, member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. In 2022, mental health disorders were the number one reason for hospitalization among children and youth ages 5 to 17. So obviously, the roadmap is not working. After languishing for months or years on wait lists, vulnerable youth who turn 18 find themselves at the back of the line on an adult wait list. Our communities need urgent funding for long-stay beds, supportive living accommodations and respite care, among other supports for children and their families dealing with mental illness. Supporting our youth mental health is not only the responsible thing to do, it is the right thing to do. Back to the Premier. When will his government properly fund community mental health programs to meet the growing needs in our communities? Again, the Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, and in fact, we have uh, seen and will continue to make investments in children and youth because we know that those needs are there. The demographics show this, and we're making those investments. It's not just idle talk, it's actually investments on behalf of the government. In 2022, we invested another $31 million in new annual funding to reduce wait lists and support the mental health and well-being of children and youth. We're innovating on new ways to treat children and youth and new means for them to have access. Three and a half million dollars step up, step down, live in treatment programs, 2.1 million in virtual walk-in counseling, connecting youth to a clinician by phone, text, or video chat, a million dollars children and youth telehealth services, four and a half million dollars one-stop talk virtual walk-in. These initiatives, Mr. Speaker, are working and they're making a difference. We're increasing access to supports. We're addressing the increased demands subsequent to the COVID uh, pandemic. We're decreasing wait times and we're improving the quality of care. Did you hear what we said? Thank you. The next Next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, my, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, consumption and treatment services sites have a role to play in arm reduction, but their implementation and specifically their placement need to be carefully considered. There are four of those consumption sites in the entire city of Ottawa, and three of them are located in my riding of Ottawa Vanier, and they are all located within 600 meters of one another and right by the Byward Market. As a result of this cluster and the proximity to namely elementary schools, the surrounding community has been severely impacted. Residents have seen an increase in violence, texts, open, open drug dealing, drug use, and people overdosing, which is even a bigger issue due to the high number of children attending school in the area. In fact, a daycare even had to close their door because they could no longer expose the children and the staff to the hardship question. created by the situation. My question to the minister is, can the minister explain how the concentration of these three consumption sites were allowed in this one area and what steps are being taken to limit the impacts on the community? The Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me state it very, very clearly. For us, public safety is our primary concern. And as we said, there is an ongoing review with respect to the consumption and treatment sites in the province as a result of the tragic incident that occurred at Leslieville this summer. 
That review, Mr. Speaker, is going to help us determine the path forward and how we can better protect the people using the services in the communities where they're located. Again, public safety is a primary concern. Until the review is complete, decisions about the sites are on pause. I can, however, assure you that your concern is noted, and I would love to continue discussing that with you in terms of how this came to be and where things stand, and perhaps uh, look at that specifically as part of that response. Process. Thank you. The supplementary question. So I do appreciate uh, the answer from the minister, and I want to underline that consumption sites have a role to play in addressing the opioid crisis, but the solution cannot end there. People who have challenges with addictions are healthcare patients needing treatment. Providing those who are addicted with a safe place to use drugs may protect them from overdose in the short term, but it does nothing to address the unwilling illness, underlying illness. We need to take a holistic approach to addiction in this province. Last week, I did ask the Minister of Health to approve the request for a proposed nurse practitioner-led clinic that could provide much-needed addictions and mental health services. Consumption sites cannot be standalone facilities. They must be truly connected to health care and mental health treatment, food banks, housing, and other social services so that we can actually help address the Question. underlying issues that lead to addictions. Mr. Speaker, what steps is the minister taking to ensure that the consumption sites in my riding actually connect to those who are addicted with the health care and social services that they need to get better? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd invite the member opposite to take a look at the roadmap to wellness and look at the plan. We have been discussing, I have raised this and have said it many, many times in the House, the continuum of care requires there to be an entire and complete process within community. So when we talk about withdrawal management, when we talk about addiction treatment, when we talk about the supports that are required subsequent to that, including the housing. Now this government, the first government to have a minister responsible for mental health and addiction is looking at these problems from the standpoint of a multi-ministerial approach to ensure that the investments are there for the individual Order. so that once the treatment's completed, they have an opportunity to reintegrate into housing, a job, and everything else that the rest of us want in the province. That's what this government doing, is doing, and Response. we will continue doing that. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Farmers in my community of Essex County are being punished because of the federal carbon tax. Many farmers need to use massive fans to dry down their crops in order to store them over long periods of time. If not properly dried, their, crane, their grains and their corn will grow mold. Many of those fans are powered by natural gas, which is now subject to the federal carbon tax. Because of this regressive and crippling tax, farmers are having to pay additional costs of approximately $2,000 or $3,000 every year. Farmers in my community of Essex County need our government to stand with them and oppose this regressive and harmful tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the federal carbon tax is negatively Question. impacting farmers in Essex County and across Ontario? The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Much, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate the, the question because it allows us to shine a spotlight on the fact that the regressive, horrible carbon tax Sorry. is pressing the farmers to no end. Ladies and gentlemen, the grain corn is coming off the fields. You know, on our farm, we harvested it last weekend, and our corn ran at 23 percent moisture. And we were happy about that because it meant we would have to use less propane to dry down the corn so it wouldn't spoil in storage. And why does that matter? It matters because we want a good quality product that is food grade so we can be producing food close to home. But the member is absolutely right when he says the carbon tax is driving up the cost of doing business on farm because it's driving up the cost of drying our crops and it's driving up the cost Response. of feeding our farms. <laughs> Grain farmers of Ontario have said by the time 
the carbon tax triples in 2030, it's going to cost farmers $2.7 billion extra dollars. And who's ultimately going to pay that? Consumers. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mo Chauvin and many other farmers in my community of Essex County are hardworking and dedicated people. Like so many other farmers in Ontario, Mo worked hard, he followed the rules, and he helped provide food for the people of our province. But because of the federal carbon tax, many farmers are being hurt financially. Many farmers now have to pay thousands of dollars more in natural gas bills because of the regressive and harmful federal carbon tax. That's not right, and it's simply not fair. That's why we need all members of this legislature, and especially the independent Liberals and the opposition NDP, to understand the financial pain that the federal carbon tax Question. is causing on so many people. Speaker, can the minister please explain what impact the carbon tax is having on families in Ontario? Order. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Really put, Speaker, the impact of this regressive carbon tax that absolutely needs to be shelved is the cost of food across Ontario and across Canada, and it's making our businesses less competitive. You know, I had the honour of opening the Ontario Pavilion at the largest food show in North America on Monday in Chicago, the private label show. And I was so proud of our Ontario businesses, from Georgetown to Newmarket and all places in between. When I spoke to them, they were doing their best, but they're concerned about their competitiveness because the cost of their products coming from the millers in terms of baked goods is going through the roof. Why? Because that carbon tax is making its way through every step of the value chain. So I would respectfully submit to the independent Liberals, they need to jump in their minivan drive to Ottawa and tell Response. those senators to stop playing games and vote and support C234. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, order, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. This government is failing to adequately staff Toronto's newest Ontario Court of Justice facility. In September, a man charged with sexually assaulting a minor walked free because his case took too long to get to trial. Last week, another sexual assault charge against a rapist was stayed, and his case was also thrown out because of the long court delay. What a Order. waste of Toronto police resources. Speaker, despite this government's claim that they are fixing the courts, the Ministry of the Attorney General saw a base funding cut in the fall economic statement. How is the Premier justifying funding cuts to the court system when he is already failing survivors? And to reply, the Attorney General. Speaker, it's so rich coming from that member yeah. from that party, Mr. Speaker. Anti police. I, I want to say when we put $6 million to increase staffing, these members voted against it, Mr. Speaker. When we put $72 million for the criminal case backlog, these members did not support Shame. it, Mr. Speaker. I, Mr. Speaker. When we talk about funding the police, they say defund the police. When Shame. we say support victims, they say build the administration. When we say we want to modernize, they say, Order. no, we like our fax machines, Mr. Speaker. I'll take no lessons from that member from that party. Here, here. Order. The supplementary question. Political spin. Despite the political spin, what we do know is that there is a base funding cut from this ministry. In this incident, Judge Brock Jones said, there is no reason for this case to, to have not been completed had the courts been properly staffed. Instead of two full days of court time, they were wasted and the case was adjourned. In an interview with CTV speaker, Emily of Fergus, Ontario, the survivor was devastated after her case was tossed and she shared this comment. I crumbled, she said. It took so much to even do that first step of giving my statement to the police and then going to the hospital. Then after a year and a half, I decided to go back to Toronto and face the trial, face this man and tell my story. Now it's over. Speaker, what does the Premier have to say to Emily and all the survivors seeking justice after allowing their rapists to walk free? Okay. To reply, the Attorney General. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I will reiterate that any lost trial, any closed courtroom is not acceptable to this government. That is why we are picking up the pieces that were left behind by this group and this group, Mr. Speaker, because although they feign concern, Mr. Speaker, Order. they're just chasing headlines and politicizing people's tragedies, Mr. Speaker. They're doing nothing. Order. We're standing up for the people of Order. Ontario. They sit on their hands. Every time we vote to support resources, Order. modernization, the police, technology, Mr. Speaker, improving classification of workers, everything that we're doing, they're Order. sitting on their hands. So, Mr. Speaker, they I manifest change, Order. but they do nothing. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture. At the beginning of October, the beef farmers were here for their annual lobby day. And during question period, the member from Peterborough Kawartha lobbed a question over to the minister asking how the government is ensuring the beef sector continues to fuel the economy. The minister reiterated contributions beef farmers make, but made no mention of the requested $100 million bump up to the risk management program, the number one reason the beef farmers were here that day. RMP not only benefits beef, but also fruit, vegetable, grain, whore, oil, seed, lamb, veal, and pork producers. Speaker, that same day the minister said, and I quote, Ontario beef farmers understand that they finally have a government that listens and understands. And this morning we keep hearing about the carbon tax and, and how it is hurting our farmers. And yet, it is indeed regressive and unfair, but there's a saying where I come Question. from. Maybe you should stick to your knitting, because this government has an avenue. It has an opportunity to support our farmers. Speaker, if this government and the minister have listened and understood, why haven't Ontario farmers seen an increase to RMP? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Very much. Well, Speaker, I'd like to share it with the member opposite that it's our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, that listened to the beef farmers and all of our commodity organizations in our uh, coalition that were asking for support. And when we came into power in 2018, we increased. We listened and we responded by increasing the risk <laughs> management program. And that program is working. That program has done so well. I can tell you with absolute certainty that our grain farmers of Ontario were kept whole because of the progressiveness and the assertiveness we've addressed that program Order. with. And beef farmers of Ontario have benefited from the manner in which the risk management program is being facilitated in this province. And actually, they work for them this year and they're being kept whole. And Speaker, I can't wait till next Monday when I make an announcement that Response. absolutely demonstrates how we continue to support farmers in Ontario. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. No commitment from this government this morning, but you know who are committed? Our farmers, committed to feeding all of us and ensuring Ontarians have access to safe, healthy, top-quality food. And what we've heard again this morning is the minister cherry-picking items we've already heard, but refusing to acknowledge the biggest concern of most of our farmers, a concern that, if addressed, would help support succession planning and give farm families the confidence to weather an often fluctuating and unstable environment. The return on investment is highly profitable. For every dollar paid through RMP and SDRM, gross economic output is increased by between $2 and $3.60. We need the next generation of farmers to take responsibility for producing food, and the RMP program plays a critical role in ensuring that will happen. Speaker, Question. when will the minister strengthen Ontario's food security and the sustainability of the ag sectors by increasing RMP funding? to $250 million. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I can give the member opposite certainty when I say we have a, an amazing working relationship with the coalition that receives support through the risk management program. And we continue to listen and we continue to work towards programs that make sense. And I can tell you, what we've done to date is putting our farmers in the best position possible to be competitive, not only across Canada and North America, but around the world. And ladies and gentlemen, I can't wait to share our announcement on Monday as a perfect example of how our government continues to listen and we continue to get the job done for Ontario farmers. Thank you very much.
The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Adams. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. With the carbon tax set to increase rapidly by 2030, this will mean substantial increases in the cost of heat, gas and grocery bills for hardworking individuals and, and families. Some area of this, uh, Speaker, in rural and, and that. Sometimes the mouth doesn't work. In rural and northern Ontario, families are struggling to keep the heat on. Some areas of this province, temperature can drop to minus 30 in the winter. So increasing the carbon tax will only mean higher expenses at a time when Ontario families are already struggling because of the high interest rates. For those of us who live in Ontario's rural, remote and northern communities, the effects of the carbon tax are disastrous. It's not fair or right that rural and northern Ontarians are being forced Question. to pay more because of where they live. So, Speaker, can the minister please share his views on the disparity of the federal carbon tax and its negative impact on the rural people of Ontario? Minister of Energy. To uh, my colleague, uh, the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington, and my neighbour in eastern Ontario as well, you know what else doesn't work? federal carbon tax. It doesn't work for anybody. It doesn't even work for the federal government, Mr. Speaker. The federal government told us when they implemented the carbon tax that it was going to reduce emissions and that people were going to get back more than they put in through the carbon tax rebate. We now know that both of those things aren't true, Mr. Speaker. The Bank of Canada has confirmed that the carbon tax is driving up inflation across our province, making things more expensive. And we now know that a federal agency, the Commissioner of the Environment, has reported that the federal government is going to miss their own emissions targets, Mr. Speaker. So what have we accomplished here? All we have accomplished with the federal carbon tax is driving people into energy poverty, Mr. Speaker. They did drive down emissions. Response. They drove up the cost of everything. They're all for two, Mr. Speaker. It's time to scrap this tax. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I have to agree. The carbon tax is driving up the cost of utilities as it is driving up the cost of everything else. People across this province are struggling. Life is more unaffordable today because of the imposition of the federal carbon tax. Mm -hmm. While the federal government recognizes the hardship that this tax is causing for Atlantic Canadians, apparently they fail to understand that many individuals and families across Ontario are also struggling. Right. By exempting only the heating oil from Atlantic Canada mm -hmm. from that carbon tax, the federal government sends a strong message that not everyone is being treated equally. The people of Ontario should not be punished by this regressive and harmful tax while other provinces are being exempted. Speaker, can the minister please share his views about the far-reaching negative impact that this regressive carbon tax Question. is having on the lives of so many Ontarians? Minister of Energy can reply. Speaker, we've been clear since day one that the carbon tax wasn't going to be effective. Uh, we fought the federal government all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada on this issue, Mr. Speaker. We know that the federal carbon tax is just driving up the cost of everything. It's making it more expensive for that mom taking her kids to hockey practice. It's making it more expensive for our local police services to operate because the price of rolling vehicles through our streets to make sure they're safe is driving up the costs for them. For people that are heating their home, Mr. Speaker, this is having a negative impact. The federal government chose to carve out Atlantic Canada from the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, yet the Federal Liberal Caucus makes up half of their caucus in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. Why are they not carving out home heating costs for the people of Ontario, Mr. Response? Speaker? It's a very, very fair question. And why is the Ontario Liberal Caucus, as small as it is, continuing to support their federal cousins in Ottawa? It's time to scrap this tax once and for all. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. A new report released by the Daily Bread Food Bank and North York Harvest found that one in ten people in Toronto are now Order. making use of food banks. Speaker, that is double the rate of 2022. There are over 2.5 million visits in the past year to food banks in Toronto alone, a 51% increase. Food banks across Ontario are reporting similar increases as well. 
Speaker, it is clear that we are facing a food insecurity crisis <coughs> in this province. Food banks themselves know that distributing food will not solve the issue. Food insecurity is a public policy issue requiring public policy <laughs> solutions. So, Speaker, my question to the Premier is, how is this government going to address the growing food insecurity crisis in Ontario? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for that very important question. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you, with the rising cost of everything now in the province, we know that the people are feeling, which is why the Minister of Energy clearly mentioned that we need to do better at all levels of government to make sure we get rid of a, the punishing carbon tax that adds a cost to everything, yeah. Mr. Speaker. I can tell you, as a government, through a $96 million investment that we're making Order. through the Ontario Trillium Foundation to community partners, including food banks, Mr. Speaker. On top of that, for our students, so that students don't go hungry, Mr. Speaker, we increased the, uh, the student nutrition program. We raised the minimum wage. We're removing tolls from highways. We, we kept the 10 percent savings at, at the gas pumps. Response. Mr. Speaker, we are making life more affordable for Ontarians at a time when we know life is more unaffordable. We ask the opposition to support us in this, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker, food banks are not the solutions. We need a public policy solution, and the minister knows that. The 2023 Daily Bread Food Bank uh, report also shows that there has been a 36 per cent increase of people relying on food banks in my community of Scarborough. People just simply do not have enough. They're working multiple jobs, and they do not have money left over after they pay their rent or other bills. People just do not make enough, even after working multiple jobs, to pay for food. That's the reality in this province, Speaker. Why is the government turning a blind eye to the surge in Scarborough residents and residents across this province who are resorting to food banks due to the soaring cost of living? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I think I mentioned in my uh, first response, Mr. Speaker, that we are there to provide the supports for Ontarians who need it. But you know what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker? I thank the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, yes, who is going you. out to bring those high-paying, good jobs for the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. We don't want people to be in poverty. We will fight for them to make sure that they have more income, bigger paychecks, Mr. Right. Speaker. Now, again, the supports will be there for, for Ontarians who need it. But under the leadership of Premier Ford, the manufacturing jobs, those good-paying jobs who left the province of Ontario are coming back thanks to this Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, Mr. Speaker. So, again, I ask my colleagues across Order. to work with us to ask the federal government to remove the punishing carbon tax that Response. adds the cost of everything in this province, Mr. Speaker, and let life be more... Yeah. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. I have a question for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Oh, great, when I was back in the riding last week, I heard repeatedly how the federal carbon tax is making life more oh unaffordable for Shame. people. Carbon tax is increasing the cost of everything for the people in my riding. The fuel in their cars, groceries they buy, and the electricity they need to heat their homes. Many individuals and families have also told me that the carbon tax is even making hunting, fishing, and traveling in rural, remote, and northern parts of our province too expensive. It's not right and it's not fair that this regressive tax negatively impacts the quality of life for so many people in Ontario. That's right. Speaker, can the minister please explain about the negative impact that the carbon tax is having on so many households and how it's impacting the cost of living Order. for so many. Yeah. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thanks so much, Speaker, and I appreciate the question. You know, in Northern Ontario, hunting and fishing is a way of life. It's actually a pastime for many people all throughout Ontario that want to enjoy that. And of course, now when they want to try and do it, well, you know, the family loads into the truck, they want to go to the camp, they got to stop at the gas station, they get to pay some carbon tax. They get to fill up the gas tans to run the Jenny at the hunt camp, they get to pay 
carbon tax. I mean, this tax is really, it's just part of everything we do now, and it is providing absolutely no positive benefit. You know, if the Liberals want to help out our friends across the border, maybe they should spend some time not kneecapping Order. each other during their leadership race and trying to find productive ways to talk about how to get rid of the carbon tax once somebody gets to be the leader that gets to drive the van. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Great. The carbon tax will only worsen. The cost is expected to nearly triple by 2030. This will mean that fuel prices will increase, creating a ripple throughout the economy and raising the cost of absolutely everything. This is only making life harder and more expensive for people living on a budget, like our seniors, or for our families throughout Ontario. This is especially true for people living in northern Ontario who have a greater reliance on their vehicles for transportation. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax impacts people in Ontario's rural, remote and northern communities? Good question. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Three words, Mr. Speaker. Outrageous, egregious, preposterous. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to standing.